Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're very much welcome today to the work to the cost of reopening, who is paying? Look, I think as we are seeing all across the world, uh, the rebuilding process and coming out of lockdowns is probably proving harder than many forecast and than many expected. And actually, one of the things we want to analyze today is actually how is that impact on cost, on finance, and the financial planning that's going to all businesses. In a webinar we hosted last month in June, uh, it was noted by the majority of those who attended that they didn't expect to see recovery until 2023. So it does sound like we've got a long road ahead of us. So how prepared are we and what do we need to do to prepare in time? But it has to be said, this is just a forecast. We're all learning as we go along. The last time in London we faced such a situation was 350 years ago. So it's natural that we don't have the knowledge to fall back on. And actually that knowledge is re relatively rare all across the world, which makes knowledge share probably even more important than it, than it normally is. So that's the value of today's sessions, is actually how do we share knowledge? How do we come together to look at ideas and look at uh, new thinking as well? Uh, COVID-19 has reset the way we talk about the economy, the way we're talking about communities and about people too. There is a new narrative emerging. And again, that's what we want, the things we want to again cover today. It has been arguably one of the greatest catalysts of change for the last 60 years. I'm therefore delighted to be hosting this session uh, for you today alongside our great friend from HVS, from Alex Partners and from Bird and Bird. And I hope you find it of real value and enjoy it. Uh, before we start, we have some questions for you. So um, Alex, if you could raise the first question, please. Please indicate which part of the hospitality sector you are mostly closely involved with. Finance, operations, development, marketing, sales, ownership, investor, private equity, bank, lender, advisory, consultancy, legal, education, stroke student. Thank you. Yeah, very interesting. Um, and now the second question, please, Alex. Please indicate your role within your organization. Chairman, partner, owner, director, hotel general manager, senior manager, department head, supervisor, operative, other. Thank you very much indeed. And now the final question, please, Alex. When do you consider it be prudent for the hotel set in your loca location to open once government has pressed the green light? And obviously green light has been pressed in a number of places. So already open in less than two weeks, two to three weeks, four to five weeks, one to two months, or three months or more. So 45% already open, so that's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we have three sessions coming up. And I'm going to introduce in a second Graham Smith from Alex Barnes, who's going to do a session on planning, financial planning for the restart. We're then going to pass on to Karen Freeb and James Salford from Bird and Bird to look at legal challenges and the managing tensions between stakeholders. And then finally, we're going to go to an excellent panel being chaired by Russell Kett, Chairman of London Office for HBS, which I think will be very thought-provoking. So I hope you enjoy the next hour and a half. So firstly, it's my pleasure to introduce Graham Smith, the Managing Director of Alex Partners. And Graham, I hope you have a good session. Good luck. Thanks, Chris. Um, appreciate the introduction there. So, as it says, Graeme Smith, um, I head up the hospitality and leisure team at, uh, at Alex Partners and appreciate everybody uh, joining this morning for this webinar. Um, at Alex Partners, we work with businesses to help them through uh, transformative situations, either uh, operationally, digitally, through M&A transactions or restructuring situations. And in the hotel uh, industry, 
in the UK, we've worked on a, a broad range uh, of situations advising clients through these um, uh, particular challenges and particular in some of these uh, restructuring scenarios as we find ourselves in today. So I'm going to talk through our uh, perspectives on how to plan for the restart, um, taking that through into understanding what a funding need might be for that, and then some of the options available to meet that funding need. So everyone remembers back to the start of this crisis. Um, I think it's fair to say that hotel companies took immediate action um, given the crisis to, to stabilize and preserve liquidity. We saw um, you know, full use of, of government schemes, whether it be furloughing, uh, rates, holidays, or VAT deferrals, um, taking financial steps to engage with the financial stakeholders to draw down on working capital facilities, get cash into the business and, and get standstills, and also engaging with, with creditors in order to uh, you know, prevent action being taken whilst uh, hotels were, were closed. So you know, I think all of this was, was done quickly and enable people to actually put their businesses into you know, a form of hibernation so that they could survive through to the, the reopening uh, process. Um, and that's where we stand now, you know, where we are going through this, the reopening process, all about how do we do that safely um, and how do you cope with the uncertainty. And this, this slide here looks to set out what we think is really important when, uh, when planning for, for reopening, which is around actually scenario planning. You know, we're facing into a situation where demand levels are, are uncertain. Um, so therefore, as, as business owners and operators, then, you know, we need to look at uh, what are the potential scenarios here in terms of, you know, when do hotels uh, reopen? What's the speed and extent of any demand recovery? And also what happens to the operational cost base to that uh, reopening program and, and really try and find those scenarios, often, a, you know, kind of a high, medium and low case to, to understand the implications and feed that through into, uh, first of all, uh, cash flow scenario planning. You know, cash is absolutely critical in this phase. And we're gonna step into um, a little later around a really important tool, which is the 13 week rolling cash flow forecast. Um, and having done that and looked at the scenarios, really assess what cash conservation actions might be possible. Um, and then also to, to take that and think, well, you know, what can be done with the, the central support functions um, of the hotel business? What, uh, what's the minimum central team that can be brought back initially to, to reopen and how does that step up as, uh, as revenues and activities uh, increase? Uh, a concept that we talk a lot about um, in these uncertain scenarios is operational agility. Um, what do we mean by that? Well, that's all about how do you get that feedback from your GMs uh, in the field who are able to um, you know, feed back to the center around what they're experiencing, uh, what's working, what's not, and then taking that learning and, and passing it out then across, uh, across the group so that the business can, can adapt and, and react to that changing marketplace. Commercial flexibility is really important. So you know, what, what arrangements can be agreed with, uh, with brands, um, with, uh, with landlords and suppliers, to enable that um, uh, volatility to be absorbed through um, more flexibility in the cost base. And then all of this, when you plan through the scenarios, feeds into actually the funding options. You know, what is the new money need? Um, how, where can that be sourced from? Is it from the existing stakeholders or do you need to look external to the business? So when you've done this scenario planning, one of the key outputs is really to understand what happens to uh, cash on a, uh, on a medium term basis. And here's just an example chart that we would uh, typically create, which helps to understand what is the base case scenario uh, for a business from a cash perspective. And then how does that impact in that kind of sensitized or downside case? Um, and what we're expecting to see and will see is that, you know, in the first uh, pinch point comes as you reopen, uh, you start to have to settle creditor balances that have built up 
um, maybe people start demanding payment ahead of time, that generally creates the first uh, pinch point in the, in the funding position. And then also as we look forward into the winter, obviously concerns exist around the uh, potential for future lockdowns in a key trading period in, in November or December. Um, you know, lockdown in, in that particular area can, um, can cause a, a deviation and, and a pressure on, on cash. And as you take that forward, uh, we see on the right hand side of the chart, when you start to see the line uh, dip below the zero, that helps you to uh, assess the, the funding need that this plan could potentially create and therefore the funding flexibility that the business needs in order to confidently reopen and trade through to more normalized times. We talked earlier around the 13 week cash flow. So the previous chart showed more of a medium term position looking 12 months forward. Um, once you get into these uncertain situations, then really having a, a, a very tight control on cash is, is critical. So this 13 week rolling weekly cash flow forecast is a tool that you know, we use all the time when helping businesses to, to get through um, these uh, cash difficulties all about looking at what, what are the expected receipts, what are the expected payments, and understand where those peaks might be on a weekly basis, um, uh, in addition to just on a, on a monthly basis. Um, and what it really forces you to do is look at what are those periodic payments that come through, whether it be um, on, on tax, whether it be on payroll, uh, rental costs, uh, as they tend to be the triggers that create uh, peak cash need. Um, also look at this through the, through the different scenarios as well to understand um, you know, where the pinch points, points might be in the first uh, three months. And then also as you implement this tool and use it going forward, it's helpful to look back and see how reality compared to your forecast. So you start to get a good sense of your accuracy within that. All of this helps you to understand um, the funding need that you face as you reopen. Once that's understood, then it's really important to then understand how that can be sourced. First port of call, absolutely to look at your uh, existing uh, financial stakeholders, your shareholders, your uh, debt providers. Um, and within that, you need to understand and look at the, uh, the financing agreements that you have in place. And um, you know, they'll be picking that up on the legal session just after this. What are the stakeholder dynamics and motivations? How supportive are they to, to stay in and, and support this? And then uh, important to understand how much time you've got available. What are the key milestones by which funding needs to flow? Then once you've done that, you can assess your alternatives. Uh, are there ways that new money needs to come into the structure? Uh, can it be um, dealt with through repayment or interest rate holidays? Do you need to look at asset disposals or even something more fundamental, such as um, a restructuring agreement like a, a, a CBA, a company voluntary agreement? Um, what you also need to understand is if they aren't possible, then what is the contingency plan? What's the fallback plan? Can you look externally? Um, does the business need to be uh, sold, for example, or you know, if in a, the downside scenario, um, does it face the risk of insolvency? After understanding all of that, you can develop the proposal to put to your um, internal stakeholders um, and through that agree a negotiating timetable by which you want to, to get to a revised agreement. And then you step into that negotiation process. Um, now, what I would say about that is that um, it, it can be difficult and challenging, particularly when you're looking for people to make changes and accept changes to their agreements and protections. And there's always the risk that um, you know, this is not successful, agreement cannot be reached. So uh, if that's the case, you really then do fall back into your uh, contingency plan uh, scenarios. Now, the good news is in the, in the sector is that um, if you're not able to secure the support from uh, your existing stakeholders, there is a, a wide range of external funding options available um, for hoteliers. You know, the hotel sector is, um, has been attractive for funding providers and continues to be so. Um, whether that's through government-backed schemes with C bills and CL bills, um, you know, this has been uh, very popular. It's been implemented effectively in the, uh, the hotel industry. Um, more and more institutions are becoming uh, approved for this. Uh, what I would say though is that it is, um, it's not guaranteed that it will be approved. So, um, uh, you know, you do need to have alternative options for it. 
the banks and, and the credit funds um, still very much attracted to the hotel uh, sector. You know, credit assessments are a little tougher. You know, this is a difficult environment and people have, you know, understood, you know, the impact of uh, cyclicality uh, on the industry. So again, you know, optionality is, is really important. You know, banking tends to be uh, lower cost um, uh, than the credit funds, but um, you know, the credit funds tend to provide more flexibility and actually some of the, you know, the new challenger banks um, falling somewhere between the two. I think what we will see in this stage of the, the cycle is um, an increase in activity from what we call the kind of the special opportunity funds. Um, others might call them hedge funds, but it's very flexible capital it can be equity all the way through to, to debt and can move very quickly. Happy to inject money into existing structures um, and often have strong kind of real estate skills. So, you know, can understand that underwriting process uh, quickly and also keen to support acquisitive growth. And then lastly, that we've raised on here and other uh, options obviously um, exist, but private equity, a um, lot of dry powder to uh, invest in the, in the industry, a um, lot of experience in the, in the sector and can structure deals to um, you know, keep existing shareholders involved either through minority deals or deferred returns uh, and very much willing to, to take risk and invest early on in the cycle. So, in conclusion, you know, the, the, the restarting process is, is uncertain. It can be volatile. So understanding the scenarios is key. There are absolutely options to be looking at when it comes to new money. But importantly, this all takes time. So it's important to uh, act with, with urgency to understand what the options are so that the businesses in your hotel groups can reopen uh, effectively and take advantage of the recovering demand environment. Thank you. Chris. Hi, Graham. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi. So firstly, if there's a question, I'll just uh, hopefully get the video going in a second. Um, there we go. Um, a question from the audience. And again, for all those in the audience, if you want to ask a question, please do on the Q&A, on the chat and the Q&A um, at the bottom of the uh, screen. Um, someone asked, as though the 13-week rolling cash flow forecast is really important, how about don't you need to also have the next three years planned out? As it's going to be that three-year recovery, assuming it's going to be that three-year recovery. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the focus um, of this is very much the, the liquidity position, both in the short term and the first 12 months. And what we're, our experience is in recovery cycles is that you uh, tend to run into liquidity needs uh, in that first three months. And then also then as you run through the cycle of the year, uh, then you can often reach uh, further low points in the cash cycle before as the top line uh, recovers, you're then able to rebuild your uh, cash balance as time uh, goes by. So the focus on the first three months and then the first 12 months um, is then really to understand what is that immediate funding need to uh, enable the business to reopen effectively. Uh, but of course, as you get through into you know, the broader assessment of the business and its uh, opportunity and its value uh, is recovered, then um, that's much more in the realms of that kind of three to five year uh, business planning process, um, which will be important as well for people to understand, well, what's my potential exit value uh, in the end for this when we all do get back to uh, happier and more profitable times. Thank you. Can I put you on the spot a bit here because you've done a great presentation of what everyone needs to think about. What concerns you about the next year or two? What, what are your greatest fears about what you're going to see? Yeah, so the obviously everyone's watching with with interest um, when it comes to the the potential impact of uh, of localized uh, lockdowns, for example, in um, in in Leicester, um, uh, and also with regard to um, you know what's going to happen with international travel. Um, so really, the, the 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 biggest challenge that we find as we speak to to hotel operators is is that uncertainty in the uh, in the demand environment. Um, and just being able to create enough flexibility in the hotel group's cost structure to be able to, uh, to absorb that 
and know that they've also got enough financial flexibility to, to trade to that should we hit more bumps in the road um, on the, uh, the overall recovery trajectory. And look at your graphs. You seem to think the beginning of next year is going to be a particularly difficult time. Is that fair? Yeah, so I think the um, yeah the initial period as as we reopen and um, we get into uh, August and, and September, um, then you know bills need to be paid, and um, you know we're going to go through um, a phase of of cash demand for for reopening, and also as government support schemes start to be uh, wound back, um, then you know that has uh, that creates concerns, but then. You know, typically then as we get through into, uh, you know, January and February times, which tend to be, you know, quieter in the, uh, the sector as well, um, then that's when we tend to see those uh, cash resources uh, dip before uh, recovering again. And, look, and again, an unfair question, I appreciate, but obviously the feedback is it's going to be a three year recovery to get back to 2019 levels. Do you agree on that or do you think that's a bit too conservative? Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I think we, you know, we could well see, um, you know, a, a strong bounce back to, to begin with, particularly if, um, you know, overseas uh, travel is, um, is somewhat restricted. Um, but I think after that initial bounce, then, you know, I think there is the risk that, you know, businesses have been impacted by this. People's own personal balance sheets have been impacted by this. Um, which puts pressure on uh, corporate spend and disposable income. So the um, you know, the recovery beyond that, the trajectory of it um, is is difficult to forecast. I think you can talk to you know, five different people and get five different views as to the the letter that describes the shape of the uh, of the recovery. Um, I'm a ter- I'm an eternal optimist though, so um, I would hope that we uh, we get there sooner than 2023. Oh, Graham, look, thank you very much for today. Um, it's a great presentation. Thank you. And uh, I, look to, uh, I look forward to seeing you again. And thank you again. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and now we're going to turn to the second session uh, with Karen and uh, Freed and Jane Salford from Bird and Bird. If I can bring them onto the screen. And pass over. Good luck and I hope you enjoy. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm Karen Freeve. I head up Bird and Bird's international hospitality and uh, leisure team, which includes uh, a big focus on the hotel sector. And my partner, James Solford, is uh, a hotel finance specialist and leads our international real estate finance team. Uh, We're going to be talking to you together today in conversation, and we're going to cover two key aspects, which is... um, First, really managing the cost of reopening, and then we're going to move on to some of the financial issues um, that we have been seeing, certainly from a legal point of view, in the advice that we've been giving to our clients. Thanks, Karen. So, uh, Graham rightly pointed out that that controlling costs is going to be critical for for hotels as they open up, but as many of our viewers will be aware, there, there are lots of different operating models in the sector. And uh, how easy do you think, Karen, it will be for owners to uh, manage costs given the challenge from the brands to maintain their brand standards? Well, James, I think in all cases, the parties need to look very carefully uh, as a starting point at the specific terms of their agreements, whether they be hotel management agreements, franchise agreements or agreements with white label operators. These operating models and the terms of the underlying agreements will drive what controls an owner might have. With a hotel management agreement, an owner is likely to have limited control, but the owner is again the party that picks up the bill, including staff costs, operational costs and capex. On that analysis, the operator calls the shots. The costs of complying with COVID related requirements, such as the distancing rules, are placing an even greater burden uh, on owners. And they're looking to offset them by cuts in other areas, sadly, including staff costs. However, this is after all a partnership with an inbuilt long-term relationship. And what we've been seeing in many cases is a good dialogue between owners and operators regarding the resetting of budgets, and the variation or waiver of terms of hotel management agreements to try and secure the future 
of the business and that relationship. This has involved the parties reaching an accommodation on a matters such as staffing levels and an ability for the owner to use the FF&E reserve for the running costs of the business. In return, operators have been looking to suspend or negotiate away income guarantees. With a franchise agreement, the challenge is more managing the brand. There's a tension clearly between the need to cut or manage costs and the brand's need and requirement for its brand standards to be maintained. Again, dialogues have by necessity been taking place between franchisor and franchisee regarding cost cutting and the relaxation of the strict adherence to brand standards. A deferral of CapEx could, of course, however, be storing up problems for the future. We've seen cases in previous recessions where a hotel has been starved of CapEx for years. Then, when things improve, the owner wants to sell and the brand's consent is required. And that consent can often be withheld until a PIP, a property improvement programme, has been implemented and agreed with the brand. All the more reason for a discussion around CapEx and compliance with brand standards to be had and documented now. Um, a white label operator tends to have shorter term contracts, but will be keenly interested in its profit levels and equally keen to engage in discussions with its hotel partners regarding cost cutting and optimization of profit. Perhaps the white label operators will see more opportunities to expand their portfolios in the current environment. And I'm sure Ashley from Cycas, who is on our panel um, a little bit later, will have more to say on this subject. So we'll look, we'll look forward to her comments on that. Thanks, Karen. Uh, yeah, totally, totally agree. I, I guess the other area, and it's an area we've been giving a lot of advice to clients is, is in terms of uh, terminating getting out of contracts that's across the board both in terms of franchise and hmas but also across a range of supply contracts it has covid given parties an opportunity to get out of contracts or has it been harder to for people to trigger things like performance tests this is an area that we've been looking at quite frequently at the moment um, in most cases a hotel management agreement will disallow the application of a performance test in a financial year where an event of force majeure, such as a pandemic, has arisen. Um, we have been advising on a number of agreements that contain a suspension of the requirement to perform services while an event of force majeure is continuing. Some also have a termination right for one or both of the parties to the contract in the event uh, that the force majeure situation continues for more than a specified period of, say, three, three months. What you do have to do is carefully check the terms of your agreement to ensure, first of all, that the force majeure clause covers pandemics. Also, importantly, termination rights may have crystallised and may no longer be enforceable, given that UK government guidelines allowed hotels to open as of the 4th of July. Um, we've seen a, a variety of genuine terminations, but in other cases, parties have perhaps unsurprisingly, been using termination rights as a lever to renegotiate the terms of a contract. Um, termination will, of course, in most cases, trigger the requirement for the repayment of any unamortized uh, portion of key money that may have been paid, which could um, separately give rise to cash flow issues for the payer. Thanks, Karen. And I think there's been an awful lot of coverage in, in our previous session about the impact on the F&B industry. And, uh, you know, clearly F&B has been a key part of the hotel industry for some time. Um, we've been involved in a lot of outsourcing arrangements where hotels have outsourced to celebrity chefs and other. How do we think that there are going to be some real challenges there in terms of how those relationships will work going forward? What, what do you see coming out of those, those contracts in terms of the, the position for restructuring post-COVID? Well, more, more and more F&B operations are an area where current profitability issues are crystallising and we are seeing a number of terminations and re-gearings. There have already been a number of high profile insolvency scenarios involving celebrity chefs. Parties to these type of restaurant consultancy agreements do need to analyse carefully the cost model and the responsibilities of the service provider to ensure that they are still viable and fit for purpose. You may no longer need such a um, 
a comprehensive service from the provider. Indeed, they may no longer be able to do what was originally envisaged, and therefore the fee structure has to be looked at again. Again, any changes to the existing agreement should be very carefully recorded and documented and not just left um, uh, as an oral agreement because that will only be storing up problems for the future. And Karen, obviously in all of those agreements, the, um, the outsourcing is not just the restaurant, but fairly common for, to see the outsourcing of the, of the room service product as, as part of those agreements. And that's going to be quite a critical product for hotels going forward, isn't it? If people are less willing to eat in restaurants, the room service becomes quite, quite challenging. And, and, and do you think the operators are going to be able to deliver that cost effectively if the restaurant's only running at 40, 50 percent capacity? Well, that's, that's a difficult one, isn't it? And I know that in some cases, um, room service has really uh, come under very close scrutiny, but it's something that's part of the overall, or overall package that will need to be looked at. Distancing requirements obviously are a, a major factor as well in all of the services that will be provided. Moving on, we've, we've talked about franchises and management agreements, which, which is an awful lot of what we do, but, but we deal with an awful lot of hotel leases, and particularly our, our colleagues across our, our European network, uh, where leases are far more prevalent than they are on the UK market. We, we've seen an awful a lot of challenge there. And of course, the, the million dollar question is the UK government and many European governments have brought in protections to stop landlords terminating leases. The UK protection expires at the end of September. The million dollar question for an awful lot of those leases of what is going to happen to the unpaid rent that's been missed in, in our case, March, June, September, but across Europe, there will be other rent payment dates. But there's, there's an awful lot of unpaid rent from empty hotels that just not going to be going to be paid. How, how do you think that's going to work out? Well, well, you're right, James. The, the March quarter day was the first time when tenants were beginning to think, that they're going to have an issue and they really should do something about this. We then had the June quarter. I think with the September quarter um, looming, there are going to be a lot more negotiations coming up about um, renegotiation of, of rental payments. We're advising a number of parties to leases, including hotel leases, on ongoing rental obligations. Most tenants, I would say, are seeking rent extensions and either short or longer term rental reductions. Uh, tenants who don't currently pay a turnover rent based on profits of the business are seeing this as a more attractive model than market rents or rents geared to RPI or CPI. And in for, in, of course, many market or geared rents are just no longer viable. We don't have time today to talk about ground leases, but these are widely predicted to be in a danger zone all of their own. The government's coronavirus measures uh, have addressed the four most common remedies pursued by landlords against tenants for arrears of rent. That's forfeiture, commercial rent arrears recovery, statutory demands and winding up petitions. And as you say, these have broadly been suspended until the 30th of September. But other possible remedies have not been restricted. These include the right for landlords to charge interest on arrears, um, debt proceedings and administration orders. Landlords also can and some have been taking money out of tenant rent deposits, uh, regardless of tenants pleading to the contrary, and have been saying we're taking the money out of the rent before and we expect you to make it up. These, for example, from parent companies. Organisations code of practice for commercial partnerships uh, during the COVID pandemic. And those include UK Hospitality and the British Beer and Pubs Association have agreed until 2421. Uh, a possible solution for the parties to work towards and can be very useful as a, a roadmap for negotiations and to guide the discussions. However, the code in itself does recognize that um, a negotiated solution may ultimately not be possible. Um, we may well see some landlords seek to forfeit leases later this year, once the COVID legislation restricting forfeit, uh, forfeit comes to an end. But of course, it is to be hoped that um, negotiated solutions will, will be uh, something that the parties can find a, may, a way with. Thank I think, 
Karen, I was going to say, in terms of forfeiting lists, I think one of the things landlords need to think about is it's all very well to have that right, but you need to think about what, what can replace it. And clearly, if they bring in a new tenant, they may well want incentive to sign up to a new lease. They may want a rent-free period. So it, it isn't a total panacea simply to terminate the current arrangements. People do need to have plan. But sorry, Karen. It may be better to stick with the devil you know, and certainly with some arrangements, we're certainly seeing the conclusion being that it would be better to re-gear the current arrangements, adjust the fees, etc., rather than um, to, to forfeit the lease entirely. So, um, James, I'd quite like to move on now to some finance and, and, and cash flow issues and then the tables a little. Um, how easy is it to secure short-term finance from lenders to cover working capital requirements that might be needed to reopen the business? Sure, thanks, Karen. I think that ties in quite nicely. There's a question I've seen come up from uh, Jonathan Lass, uh, which, which is how supportive the bank's been. And I think the answer is, in our experience, and I'm sure Graham and Alex Parks had a similar experience, the banks have been hugely supportive of um, the hotel sector. Um, certainly, we've been involved in, in a number of um, bolt-on facilities where banks have lent additional working capital on existing deals. Um, Graham mentioned the Seabills facility. Uh, have some our experience has been that that's been more challenging. I think a lot of our hotel owners have really struggled to get that money. I think it's been it's been easy where um, the, the hotel is banked with one of the, the, the lenders that's in the Seabills scheme, but I think for those who have not been got their main facility with a Seabills lender it's been much harder I know Ben's on our panel later and I think Oak North is now approved or hopefully very close to being approved I'm sure they'll be um, lending some of that Seabills money and, and so hopefully we will see more and more of that flow through but but in terms of the short-term funding from banks anyway I think they've been a, 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 as cooperative as they could possibly have been and we, we've certainly seen most of the banks have really been very proactive in going out to their client base off trying to work out what they need, trying to provide additional facilities where they can. So I think they've been very proactive. I think um, Ben will probably tell us the challenger banks have been similarly proactive. I think with the debt funds, it's harder because they've got they've got uh, their own sort of hurdle rate triggers to, re to return. So I think they find it more challenging. And certainly, you know, from other jurisdictions, things like CMBS have really found it, products found it very, very hard to support the customers. So I think there, there has been a spread across the sectors. And are there any, if I have an existing facility, what other issues should I really have at the top of my agenda? Well, I think um, we're now coming out, of, most of the banks and most of the customers should hopefully have already thought about um, getting the short-term waivers to close hotels. So, so I'm assuming most, most owners have already done that. But I think people do now to think, to going back to their banks, think about what they're going to need to go forward. So it's very likely that people will need to look at financial covenants. I think a lot of lenders have waived their financial covenants up to the end of this year. Um, some I've seen have waived them, waived them beyond that. But, but clearly, if you're testing financial covenants on a, on a um, one-year look back, the performance of hotels is not going to be returned to any degree of stabilised trading for some time. So I think people need to be thinking about what they're going to do about financial covenants, because realistically... I can't see those being viably tested until December next year. Similarly, any sort of consents, any sort of waivers to hotel agreements you need to think about, do you need those consents now? So I think it's important, again, you're having dialogues. The banks, I think, have now got through the initial wave and are beginning to think ahead to the future. So I think, think just, just think about what you're going to need and think about the consent you'll need coming out of the reopening phase. Again, similarly, you'll probably need consents to dip into the FF&E account. So that's something you'll need to approach your lenders for consent on. Um, perhaps finally, James, do you think the hotel finance market will change dramatically from COVID-19? And, and if so, what do you think the main features of that change will be? Uh, I, I think the answer is the hotel finance market has been changing quite a bit over the last five to 10 years. I think COVID will rapidly accelerate it. I think we've seen debt funds really come to the fore. Um, and if you look at the deals that have been announced in the last couple of months, they're, they're almost exclusively debt funds doing deals at the moment, which, which what you'd expect given the challenges facing the banks. But I, I think we'll see that an acceleration of that trend towards debt funds being far more proactive, far more visible in the market. I, I suspect we'll see the challenger banks come into the fore, and I'm sure Ben can comment on that on that as well. 
Um, I think what's inevitable is I think we will see lower gearing over the next um, year to two years. I, I just cannot see gearing levels getting back to the level of gearing they were at before. And of course, EBITDA is going to be significantly down. So I think, think we'll see far lower debt quantums on deals from the senior banks. I think that will inevitably lead to more mezzanine finance. Uh, and I think we'll see already that there's, uh, I think Graham commented, there's a huge amount of dry powder once you come in on private equity, but the same is true with a lot of the debt funds that they have a lot of money. A lot of the MES funders have been desperate to deploy capital. That the reduction in senior debt financing, I think means it's inevitable that um, those, there'll be more opportunities for those, for those MES funders to, to come to the fore. I think Graham also commented as well in terms of there will be private equity looking to do that. So I think we may see more joint ventures. I think existing owners will need to get the capital in if we're going to see lower lower senior debt positions, more mares. I think I think we may well see more joint ventures coming forward as, as people look to co-invest on existing deals to put capital into the structure, particularly where you've got owners who are not capital rich, so they need to get that cash to, to flood through. Um, I just quickly as well, I did see one last question, which I'll answer, um, which, which is about refinance. And I think, I think that is really important. I think everybody should be looking now at when is their refinance due? Because I think over the next 12 months, it will be very hard for senior lenders to provide a huge amount of um, refinance and capital. So I think if for anyone who does have a refinance coming up in the next 12 to 18 months, I think it's critical that people look at that now, start to address it now, start to talk to their existing funders and, and, and the market generally about what their refinance options are, because leaving it late will, will potentially could leave them really exposed. So I think people need to be thinking about refinance positions far earlier than I might normally do. Good, thank you, James. Well, I think we should wrap up now um, and pass on to the really exciting part of uh, today's webinar, which is the panel uh, to be chaired by Mr. Russell Kett, Chairman of HBS London Office. Thank you very much, Karen, and I hope everyone can hear me. Not so, not, not so worried if you can't see me, but I'm going to uh, uh, thank you both for uh, your session uh, and to invite my panelists to uh, unmute themselves and um, turn on their video cameras uh, and to welcome uh, with me uh, today uh, five distinguished professionals uh, who are all keen to get their views across in the next 40 minutes. Um, so we're all going to need to keep our contributions brief and to the point, starting with my own involvement as moderator. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce you um, in uh, alphabetical order by company, um, Ashley Cuttlecan from um, Sycas Hospitality, uh, Eva Backman from Ennismore, uh, Neil Kirk from l &R Hotels, Ben Barbanel, you already got two mentions uh, in the last session from Oak North Bank. <laughs> Uh, and Wayne Arthur uh, from Stay City Hotels. Um, now, you are all with us because you know something about is every stakeholder ready? Um, and uh, I'm going to ask each of you uh, to kick off with two sentences, two short sentences. The first sentence, please tell us in one sentence who you are, who you work for, and what you do. And secondly, in your second sentence, please tell us what one issue is uppermost in your mind when you are focused on this topic of is every stakeholder ready? So we're going to go again in alphabetical order by company. So Ashley, please kick us off. Hi, uh, thanks for having us, guys. Um, I'm Asa Kotlujan, and I'm the Chief Development Officer of Psychos Hospitality. Uh, we operate across five countries in Europe and the UK uh, with 26 hotels in our portfolio. Um, I think for all of us, uh, I can start with the most pressing issue is that uh, Groft is, of course, as being the Chief Development Officer, is a uh, forefront of my mind. Uh, once we resume back to hotels, how are we going to carry on growing our business space, both from our hotel perspective and uh, customer demand perspective? Thank you. Uh, on to Eva. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm the Development Director at Ennismore, predominantly focused on the expansion of the Hockton brand across Europe. 
We currently have nine hotels up and running across Europe and North America with, a with four additional assets in the definite development pipeline. Currently, we're in the process of reopening um, our estate as we speak. So we managed to open the first two hotels in Amsterdam and Paris about two weeks ago now, and we're um, due to open our London assets throughout the course of this week and next week. So there's definitely light at the end of the tunnel, which is enc encouraging and uh, good to see. But I mean, as we come on to speak about um, during the panel, the uncertainty um, definitely remains. I think the challenge overall in, in one sentence is that, you know, I think we're all trying to be as smart as we can with the information that we have available today but no one really knows what the reality will look like tomorrow. You know, if we wake up to hundred thousands of new cases tomorrow, new government regulations may be put in place, which will affect the way we operate our restaurants and hotels and how travel across the globe is, is possible or not, so to speak. I realize I made a mistake in saying one sentence because the definition of one sentence for individuals clearly can vary. And maybe, <laughs> what, maybe one breath uh, is, the, is the right answer. Uh, Neil, how about you? Uh, CEO of London Regional Hotels. We operate hotels um, across Europe and North America. Um, we operate everything from select service to luxury resorts. Um, the concern as we head into the next few months really is the uncertainty um, in terms of guests, regulations, rolling lockdowns. So I, I think the uncertainty going to Graham's point about forecasting is probably forefront of our minds. Okay. Uh, and Ben, how about you? Hi, Ben Barbanel, uh, Head of Debt Finance at Oak North Bank. We are a relatively new bank in the UK. Uh, we got the third new banking license in over 150 years back in 2015 and have now lent four and a half billion pounds into the UK. Um, some of that into, into hotels. Um, I think for me, the biggest challenge is going to be the, are we in lockdown? Are we out of lockdown? Second, second wave, another spike. Is there going to be a vaccine? Isn't there going to be a vaccine? Okay. So in one way or another, most of you have focused on the word uncertainty, but I know Wayne will have a different view, or maybe he won't. Wayne Arthur. Yeah, so Wayne Arthur, I'm a CFO for Stay City, so we operate uh, part hotels across Europe. Um, I guess really wouldn't be a CFO without saying that my main priority at the moment is cash, making sure that we've got enough liquidity over the next two years to, to weather what we know will be, you know, could be a storm really. Okay, terrific. Well, a great panel, as I'm sure you'll agree, as we go through uh, the next session. I'm really interested uh, in any questions which the distinguished members of our audience today will have. Uh, please put them in the Q&A function, um, and I'll do my best to get to them uh, at some point in the next 30 odd minutes. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, with the help of government furlough schemes with tax deferrals, landlord forbearance, supportive suppliers, etc., many companies have effectively pressed pause on the cash flow. So, when hotels effectively either reboot the business and reopen or just get open, uh, there's an impending and rapid cash burn and conceivably that's going to peak depending on when you actually reopen uh, or trough around September or October. Now, as all of your stakeholders start to expect to revert uh, to normal payment terms, what plans do you have in place to prepare for this? Do you envisage this could become a big issue for your hotels, your company and so forth? Um, I'm going to start at the end of the line and ask Wayne to uh, kick off for that. Yeah, okay, Russell. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, I think, you know, we definitely pressed pause. We prepared for this really early. You know, it was interesting seeing Graham's slides early. We did all of those actions. Um, so our cash position has been relatively unchanged from the start of this pandemic to now, um, but it will unwind. So our main priority at the moment is to raise new debt. Um, we've had really constructive conversations with lenders. I met Ben as part of this process. So, um, you know, Oak North came on our, our radar. Um, and we're currently looking at raising new equity as well. So we are feeling fairly confident at the moment that by the end of August, we'll have lots of cash reserves. Um, we have prepared our sensitized case. So looking at Graham's chart, we've drawn something very similar to that. We call that our bear case and we've got our base case. 
Um, so we, we're looking now to make sure that we've got enough cash um, through to 2022 when we think that we might start to see some level of recovery. So all being well, we will, you know, we will have those funds in the doors by, by the end of August. We've done all of the things that Graham talked about. You know, we've had 13 week cash flows. We've been negotiating with suppliers. You know, we've got monthly cash flows when we, you know, we've got a cash flow forecast going out for the next sort of five years, really. Um, the big focus is on the next two years. Um, our expectation is the rest of this year is going to be really challenging. Um, you know, fortunately, we are trading ahead of our plan at the moment, um, but we're very mindful that there could be a second wave coming through in the winter um, when our business is at the quietest anyway. Um, and then okay. hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll reserve some cash through to next year. Wonderful. Neil, um, I accept that we're sort of preaching to the converted as far as these uh, five panellists are concerned. So what advice do you have for those listening uh, or watching whose plans uh, don't already take this into account? I, I think it's just a combination of, of what Graham was saying and, and operationally how it works your business. So it's trying to utilize the levers that you've been granted by regulation and changes within the industry. It's trying to have an understanding of where the market could go, but start off with a macro position of what you believe will happen. As Wayne referred to, when you think your business will come back to and build towards that, but have flexibility and um, models that can move quickly to assess how those those numbers will change you know if you think about it the hotels were looking to open on july the 4th but we only got government approval to open sort of 10 days before that so people are going to have to be a lot more light-footed in what happens have the ability to turn cash flows cash streams and costs on and off and accept that all stakeholders accept a new normal whether it's your guests accepting that levels of service and um, guest amenities will be different to your creditors accepting that payment terms will have to be flexed to match the revenues that will be in there. You know, we're in the position that we're both landlord and tenant, so we see both sides of the coin. Um, I think everyone just has to accept that the new normal, as they're saying, is going to be an 80%, 90% normal, and we're going to have to just flex with that. So it's create your business, your people, your clients to accept a, a flexible year almost as we potentially enter rolling lockdowns and new changes to regulations as they understand more about the virus and how it affects our business. Thank you. Um, so Eva and Ashley, um, you both, uh, your companies, deal with governments in different jurisdictions. Um, so what advice perhaps uh, do you have to cope with the ever-changing guidelines and processes that are, require you to remain compliant with health and safety requirements and so forth? Eva, do you want to kick us off? I think, to be honest, it, it's a challenge, right? And I think, um, to Neil's point, I think you just need to remain flexible and agile at the end of the day. I don't know how many times we've waited for new government announcements in various restrictions over the last three months. And it's difficult to anticipate what will happen next, I guess. And, um, yeah, operating across multiple restrictions is a challenge and I'm sure most of you listening today are, are in the same boat operating in, in various different countries and um, yeah as soon as there's a new government um, you know announcement so to speak you need to think about what it means for your day-to-day -day operation what it means for your operational standards that you have as, as part of your brand standards so to speak how you basically train staff quickly to make sure that day-to-day -day operation always remains compliant so it's just you know you got to be alert you got to watch every day what's happening and where regulations change and you got to remain on top of it and make sure that you're quick to react to whatever the next change is okay and ashley from your perspective yeah i think i find we find it very um it's not uh, well it's not as complicated as uh, it, it sounds like operating in five countries because we have mobilized teams in each country first of all so obviously our uh, team members in each country is aware and very regularly following up what's happening with the government and because we have uh, all of our <laughs> hotels pretty much all branded under international large corporations large brands uh, they are extremely proactive on every single uh, development in each country and in each jurisdiction and uh, yeah, we, we're pretty much uh, following closely with them and working closely with them. We haven't seen anything that is drastic announcement in any of the countries mm -hmm. we're operating. So we're not uh, caught off guard from 
from one day to other. I think governments has been extremely sensible about how to maintain the stability and on their announcement and their action plan. It's an interesting comment that you make about um, not many restrictions, but one of the key challenges that I see most hoteliers coming up against in the very near future is whether or not to bring certain staff back from furlough um, or whether to let them go um, full stop. Uh, and that is a really tough decision. Governments have been really helpful uh, in with their furlough schemes to, to sort of put off the inevitable. Mm. Uh, but I think some hotels, as they really look at their cash flow, are really going to have to say to themselves, well, we had X number of people before. We don't need all of X to be able to operate profitably and successfully. And having this sort of blank sheet of paper approach really gives us an opportunity to set new operational standards. So how difficult do you think it's going to become for hotels to let people go permanently without it affecting, um, you know, the, the whole of the PR of the industry and, and, and their own reputations and so forth. Um, is there an easy way that you found to do it? I, I'm ignoring Ben for the moment because I've got a really good question for him. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to stick with the hotel operators for a minute uh, and uh, stick, if you don't mind, Neil, with you for the first instance. Um, I don't think there's ever an easy way to do something like letting staff go, um, especially when, you know, a few months ago, the underlying businesses were all in good shape. I think it just goes back to um, open levels of communication with all the stakeholders involved and explain what the underlying pressures are. I think we've all seen, we, you know, no one can avoid what's going on, both in our industry and, and more globally with coronavirus. So it's about communication. It's about flexibility. It's about you know, trying to set up your staff to explain where we're going and where we hope to get to, um, because, you know, our hotels were right sized for the business they were running pre COVID. If we can get anywhere near that, we're back to those levels of occupancy. So it's explained that we have to flex our cost base alongside with our revenue and, and hope that people understand and we things are done in the correct way. But I don't think you can do any more than that. There's no never a magic wand for um, cutting costs across a business. Um, do any of you have any advice for the uh, UK Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, uh, who's about to get on his feet uh, to announce certain things? Everybody's thinking that there might be a VAT reduction for the hospitality sector mm -hmm. here in the UK. Um, any of you got some last minute advice for him? Go on, Wayne. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the furlough scheme has been superb, really. I mean, that's been huge help. Um, you know, the more certainty around that, the better. Um, business rates go through until next March. So again, you know, depending on what happens beyond that, it'd be good to get, you know, further relief into next year. So, you know, do, do you think there's any likelihood he might enable the hospitality sector to extend the furlough scheme beyond the current uh, limitations into next year even? I mean, it'd be fantastic if it was sector specific. Um, you know, we know some areas, I mean, I suppose a legal firm that have been taken that don't really need it. Um, so if, if we could get some support on that, that will enable us to, you know, maintain more jobs really. Without that, we will have to let people go, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I, I'm looking at any of the other panellists who want to jump in on this uh, advise the Chancellor question. Um, but think, if not, go on, yeah, Ashley. I mean, the business rate is, I think, is going to be really play a crucial role mm -hmm. for all of us in the coming years. Not for, you know, uh, there's a lot of hotels that are... Um, six, seven percent, sometimes eight percent of their total revenue is, uh, uh, you know, uh, contributed towards the business rates. I think that will be a great relief. And if they want to continue to offer the businesses and help also in our industry, uh, UK needs to review their stamp duty on the leases. I think that's just still the only country in Europe uh, that has such a restricted and heavy uh, burden on that. And with the uh, some operators uh, defaulting on their leases and the new negotiations going to be taking place, I think government should be a bit more relaxed on that and, and support the businesses. Okay. Uh, I promise to come back to Ben with a really juicy question, uh, mm -hmm. but I've also got some really good questions sitting in the waiting room. Uh, so Ben, I'm going to encourage you to be relatively brief uh, in uh, answering this question. Uh, we've heard from Graham this morning mm -hmm. about uh, all the various uh, loan schemes, BBL, C-bills, CL-bills, CBBs, for those who've got children, um, all these wonderful acronyms. Um, have you seen 
very many hotel companies so far taking advantage of this, uh, a, a, applying for them and, a, and so forth. Uh, what's been your experience, number one? Uh, but also just extend the answer. What's the right option for a hotel business? Any one of these or a loan through a government scheme, a loan outside the government scheme, equity, et cetera, et cetera. And one of our uh, distinguished audiences said, well, you know, what about selling? Should people be considering selling their hotels to raise cash? What's your answer? So look, I think, um, the, thanks Russell, I think the schemes have been fantastic. They've been deployed really well. I think the government's been really front footed in getting liquidity out there. Um, but there's a hidden message in all of these schemes um, that they don't want banks to just throw money out the door. So this is about doing things right by the bank. So this is very clearly a debt proposition. So it's not an equity situation. It's not a loan that's gonna be written off later. It's not free money. So the banks have, have a very obvious to ensure that they are analyzing this risk properly. Um, we, I would say since lockdown began, about 25% of our lending has been through one of the schemes. So yes, we are seeing it, we are doing it. Um, there is a few situations where it's very challenging, where for example, operators, owners have taken maybe aggressive leverage from a debt fund originally, and now they're approaching a, a regulated bank that's uh, uh, government scheme approved and asking them for help. That causes complications with ranking of security and priority of repayment, et cetera. So that's causing a few bits of angst for, for operators. Um, the situations where it's worked very well to date are where borrowers really get stuck into their emergence from this and how their working capital uh, will be absorbed as they as, as we come out of this lockdown period um, and providing those sea bills loans where there's clear COVID impact to those businesses has been something that we've been doing a lot of. Um, I think your, your, the last point of your question, look, some businesses have been over levered and, you know, the question is, should we be relying on the government at this point, regardless of whether a business was viable in December 19, to bail those businesses out with, with taxpayer money. That's a difficult one. And you know clearly um, some of those businesses that are over levered aren't gonna make it through this. Um, we are encouraging sponsor backed businesses to, to inject equity um, where possible. Um, you know, there's a, there's a limit to the extent the government will provide support. There's a limit to an extent the bank will provide support. So I think in many cases, it's a combination of bank lending, government support and equity. Okay. Um, one of our uh, distinguished delegates, Mark Goosens, has written an essay uh, on his last uh, trip or his most recent uh, and first business trip to Amsterdam uh, since lockdown. Uh, believe it or not, stayed at the Hoxton. Well done. Um, coming, to the, uh, coming to the actual question, how can a hotel company, especially franchisees, survive uh, with such high lease agreements? Um, are the owners prepared to renegotiate lease agreements in general? Because he doesn't think that the very high closed lease agreements uh, cannot, uh, can remain. So, um, Neil, you, you play um, lessee, uh, lessee and lessor, um, and I'm sure that you have a view on this, and, and then we'll just take it around the panel. Uh, again, I, th I think on all of these, you've just got to look at what the situation is. Um, I suppose we're in a slightly different position that we also have the ability to um, operate hotels ourselves. So we, unlike some lessors, um, are not afraid of taking on operational risk either. So I think it very much depends on who the lessor parties are. Some looked at it as purely a financial instrument. Um, we look at it more as an exposure to hotels. Um, in terms of renegotiating lease, I think it'd be unfair to comment on individual cases, but it, you've just got to look at them and see what the reality is. It, it goes back to the point of communication and flexibility of working with all stakeholders to understand where best to get to and understand um, what the best way is out for both parties. I don't think any lessor, any lender such as Ben would want to put a borrower or a tenant into a position of having to close. But if there is no sensible plan to come out of that, you've got to come up with alternative solutions. So 
it's looking beyond knee-jerk reactions to requests and what the longer-term sustainability of that business, your relationship with your stakeholder is. If people have a plan to come out of whatever downturn troubles they're in, I'm sure there's a discussion to be had. If people are looking just to subsidize poor business decisions of over-renting, over-leveraging with um, a bailout through either a bank lender, a lessor or a government, it's not really sustainable in the long term. And, you know, what the coronavirus may have just done is precipitated um, changes or actions to be taken in businesses that were poorly structured. Eva, anything to add to that? Yeah, I think overall, probably everyone needs to give a little bit, right, to make it work for everyone going forward. And I think particularly re referring to leases and the deals that we've seen in the market in the last 24 months or so, or even last 12 months, a lot of these deals that were signed, you know, by operators are, in my mind, not necessarily sustainable. If you're signing um, lease rents with rent coverage ratios of 1.1 on the basis of very high projections, that's probably not a sustainable way to go. And hopefully the COVID situation managed to shake this up a little bit and uh, investors, lenders are, are going to look at it slightly differently. And also operators will not quite be as aggressive if it comes to signing new leases. So I think in that space, a little bit of a shakeup is probably not a bad thing, I think, for everyone involved. A little bit of a shakeup enough for you, Wayne? Yeah, I mean, as um, you know, Eva said, really, I mean, we were fortunate that we were not too leveraged. Again, I think it will take the heat out of some deals and we are starting to see opportunities come our way now where, you know, rent deals were signed up that were probably over rented in, in the past. So mm. I think it will, it will help. And, you know, it makes us think differently, really. We know we are thinking differently about leverage post COVID as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Ashley, just to round off this question. Well, we sign uh, all of our leases are hybrid. So we have a variable component in all of our leases. So we are pretty good shape because of that and i agree with uh, wayne and eva uh, we lost several deals or quite a lot of deals to some very brave uh, uh, lessees so i think that's going to bring some adjustment and sense check to the market but also to the mm -hmm. uh, owners the lessors i think we need to be partners on this and they need to start understanding <clears throat> and valuing this hybrid um, with more partnership um, and we've seen in the market today uh, negotiations where if anyone is looking for a, a, a bit of a reduction or some compensation from their lessor today uh, they're extending their terms or they are giving some upside share in the future years when the market is uh, back up as well so those are the different solutions i have uh, seen across at the moment wonderful um i've got a question from michael hurst one of the doyens of our sector used to be the ceo of hilton a few years back, but still going strong and lovely to see him asking a question. Um, he says, and I'm sorry, Ben, uh, unless you've got something to add to this, uh, you may be making long lasting changes to your business models, but I think he's referring to the hoteliers on the panel. Um, so are you making long lasting changes to your business models instead of just hanging on and hoping that all will return to normal in two or three years time? So what long term everlasting changes. Um, I, Eva, you've just come back on, so thank you. Why don't you kick off? Um, yeah, I think we've spent a lot of time in the last three months reviewing the structure, the head office structure, but also the operational structure on site. And I think there are definitely changes which we're you know, in the process of implementing now or have implemented over the last couple of weeks that will stay in place. I mean, you know, I think it's probably not the right time for any kind of head office initiative that is, you know, a, a nice to have initiative as opposed to an absolute must um, to have in order to continue operating the hotels. So we've definitely made some changes on head office level that will, I guess, stay in place for, you know, a period to come, I would say. Also on operational um, level, we've definitely made um, some changes. We've looked at how we can maybe cluster some more of the services, especially in London, for instance, where we have three operational hotels. You know, how can we um, share positions between the three hotels? How can we have uh, more flexible contracts? How can we support the hotels from the head office in a different way? So yeah, we've definitely spent, or the operational teams, I guess, more so than myself personally, spent a lot of time analyzing head office structure as well as uh, the hotels and okay. their operating. Ashley, anything long lasting in your company? 
We have uh, run, we are constantly running different scenarios about uh, base uh, recovery period and, and worst case scenario recovery period, both operationally and financially and structurally. So today, uh, based on our uh, scenarios, we haven't got anything fundamental change on the way of operating. We already had cluster systems in, uh, in place across Germany, Netherlands and France and UK. So uh, currently we're watching and waiting until every business come back. And then depending on what scenario we're going to be facing, if it's going to be a worst case scenario with the, um, with, with the second wave, uh, deeper recession, uh, et cetera, versus uh, are we going to go into the vaccination early next year and then therefore a short recession and back to normal in two, three years time. We will see on that. Uh, probably we'll know better by the end of this year. Keep juggling. Uh, <laughs> Wayne, what about your own company? Anything yeah. long term, anything long lasting? Yeah, I mean, it's going to accelerate things that we were doing anyway. So, you know, sort of online check-in, keyless entry, we think that's an opportunity to take labour out on the front desk. Um, we're looking at going cashless now. You know, again, it's been on our mind and, you know, you know, never waste the prices for it. It's a good opportunity to sort of, you know, really accelerate some of those things that will save us labour going forward. Never waste a crisis to very bad news. Um, Neil? from your company's perspective, any, any long lasting changes that you're uh, bringing in? Yeah, I, I think I agree with Wayne. There's an evolutionary change. I think every crisis brings changes to the industry. There's an acceleration of online, whether it's contactless payment, whether it's um, online check-in, um, whether it's the IT systems. I think also just the way we operate in terms of clusters, in terms of revenue management, I think it's very easy to revenue manage in a 80, 90% market when you're tweaking around the edges. I think the algorithms of some of the revenue management systems will, um, should we say, struggle slightly when business on the books is actually going the wrong way, when you've got negative bookings. Um, and that will just, I think, only enhance revenue management that, as it's carried out in hotels, um, as we seek to understand it more with changing crises. So, I don't, is it long lasting? Yes, until the next crisis, but there will changes to the way we run our business to deal with the ones that, you know, the crisis of today, the crisis of tomorrow will be slightly different. We'll have to change again. So yes, long lasting six to seven years, maybe, but um, then something else will happen and we'll have to pivot again. Yeah, it's an interesting comment you make about revenue management systems. The ones that I've been aware of, those that deal with hotels that close seasonally, uh, a perhaps better place to give advice, whereas uh, you rely too much on the algorithms that are existing uh, in the revenue management system, mm -hmm. and I suspect you will quickly come a cropper. Uh, ben, I'm sure that there's no real change in your business other than you wanting to say yes to everybody um, and providing funds uh, on the, at the drop of a hat. Um, but I, I am not going to ignore you, but if you do want to contribute either to that question or to the next question, uh, which is from Jonathan Black, um, where he points out that some people are suggesting maximum capacity at hotels will be slashed to 80% um, of current levels uh, due to social distancing limits and so forth. So have any of you begun implementing social distancing measures that comply with this or perhaps are even more stringent? Uh, and has that put any constraints on capacity and therefore on your anticipated profitability and uh, worthiness, financial worthiness. Uh, anybody want to kick us off? Just raise your hand. Um, I'll maybe pick one of those up. So Please. I think 80% occupancy would be a lovely problem to have in, in hotels at the moment. So um, it's, it's, it's a nice dream. Um, I think in terms of capacity, I think where it's really impacted us on our hotels that have come back very strongly is an external F&B. Um, I think in terms of hotels, you know, once you're in your room, you're socially distanced. You've just got to look at housekeeping and how you get into the room. In terms of F&B and external restaurants, I think that's where it has had an impact on us that you're finding restaurants within hotels, which are busy and getting up towards that 80% have had to focus on internal guests rather than external guests. And that's probably an income stream that will be less for the hotels and more for the standalone restaurants as hotels focus on giving as much of a, a normal service to our guests as possible. So that's probably the biggest impact we've seen in social distancing and capacity. In terms of guest bedrooms, um, I'll, I'll let you know as we get more towards the 80% occupancy how, how, we, how we cope with it. 
Okay. Wayne, you had your hand up. Yeah, I mean, I think S&B is the right one there, really. I mean, we've got properties now that have hit above 90% in France. So we, we think that we can operate, you know, normally. Um, but it is the F&B. We've got, we've got one property in France where we've got a pool and we've had to, you know, sort of give people tickets effectively. And so, you know, we can only have 100 people in the pool at a time. So, but generally we think we can operate above 90, you know, above 80%. Okay. Eva or Ashley? Well, uh, extended stay hotels, sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, extended stay hotels that we have, our residence instances and stay bridges and et cetera, uh, they were actually geared up to cope with this kind of a market. So I think, uh, Wayne, and uh, we kind of lived through that uh, beauty of extended stay. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't experienced the eight person occupancy yet. I think some of our properties are mid, 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 mid 50s, probably some we'll be seeing. So we'll let you know as well, as Neil did, uh, once we have reached that capacity. But I think the lifts, are still the confusing point for everybody. Uh, we have stickers and we have guidance and etc. Uh, but just people don't know how to really both uh, as a as a customer should they come in should they go out to lift if there is other persons coming in. Yeah, I I, I don't have a lift at home. I have to go up and down <laughs> the stairs. So maybe guests should do that as well. Eva. No, I think everything has been covered just from our point of view as well. I mean, the limitation on room occupancy is not an issue. I don't think we'll get anywhere close to 80% in the next couple of weeks. And um, for Hoxton, obviously, where F&B is uh, such an important component of, of our business model, I guess, with, you know, 30 to 40% of the total revenue actually coming from F&B. Um, we're obviously watching the space very um, carefully as well in terms of how the social distancing rules have to be implemented. It's going to be an interesting experiment in London this coming weekend where we have all our F&B operations up and running. Some of our restaurants are fully booked, um, which is great to see. But yeah, let's see, I guess, how the first couple of weeks turn out and how we can manage crowds and what demand levels are actually eventually going to be there. I was wondering whether um, one of the longer term changes might be in the way that you use uh, conference and banqueting facilities, given the time that it might take for mice business to, to come back. Um, slightly surprised not to hear it from at least one of you, but uh, if you feel confident that your banqueting and conferencing uh, are going to come back at some point and you don't need to repurpose those spaces, that's fine. Uh, ben, you've heard what they had to say. Do you have anything to add in the sense of what your customers are telling you uh, from the purposes of, of, of their own business and how they're seeing uh, changes in their own businesses? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, as, as many people already said, 80% would be a nice problem to have at the moment. I think the real challenge from my perspective, Russell, is, you know, there'll be deals out there that, that have previously had occupancy is higher than 80 percent and therefore their, their their levels of leverage in those businesses would have been programmed to to allow for higher levels of occupancy and all of a sudden you've got significantly less levels and you're going to have less levels going forward there's going to be a cash flow problem when it comes to servicing bank debt and also justifying the unfurlowing of certain members of staff as we were touching on before and, and, and maintaining a profitable organization. Otherwise, um, there's no point in, as it were, running a business and, and not making any money. That's right. Um, uh, there's another question that's been sitting here for a while um, and, and I don't know when it was asked, so I apologize uh, or even by whom. Um, but do you have a view as to which sectors are going to be most impacted in the coming few years. Um, and I think they're saying three star, four star, five star, maybe limited service. D does anybody have a view as to which is going to be most impacted? And I assume that the inference is negatively impacted rather than positively impacted. Anybody? I, mean, look, I guess from a banker's perspective, it, it kind of depends what your target market is. If, you're, if your business uh, if you're business only, if you're leisure, uh, then clearly there's going to be differences. You know, I'm surprised that we've got this far in and not mentioned Brexit yet, um, which clearly, you know, is, is another issue that's, that's looming and that will have further implications for this sector too. So um, let, let's extend the question to ask the, uh, whoops, the other members of the panel. Um, yeah, to, to, you know, against all this background, as, as Ben says, the UK is going to have to deal with Brexit in the next few months. Um, what impact do you feel Brexit is going to have on the UK hospitality industry? 
Neil? I suppose one of the large uh, one of the larger impacts of Brexit in the hospitality industry was staffing and the availability of staffing. Um, given the unfortunate circumstances we're in now where our staffing requirements are probably going to be lower, that element is probably slightly blunted. Um, food cost inflation, um, cost inflation may be an impact, but I think at the moment it's focusing on what the business will look like as we come into reopening and then what the impact of Brexit will be, um, regardless of some political fudge to try and get us through the, the deadline um, coming at the end of this year to where we get to. But with one of the largest issues, I think, being staffing on a cost basis, um, it really goes to then look at where our um, return of the business will be. So to your earlier question about which segments will be impacted, I would imagine most impacted would be international corporate and first to come back will be local demand, local uh, leisure demand. So we can see that. And I think STR put some information out um, earlier this week that regional hotels are coming back the quickest where they've got regional leisure demand and urban city centers aren't coming back as urban centers aren't opening up. So that's the sector question in terms of Brexit. I think it's just going to make life slightly more difficult around the edges. Um, but some of the issues with Brexit, just as staffing become less of an issue in lower occupancy periods, um, the staffing requirements lessen and there's essentially more people out in the job market. Uh, slightly difficult, Wayne, or, or more impact? Um, I mean, I agree with Neil. I mean, previously it was probably staff that we were worried about. I think it's just another recessionary problem that we've got to face into next year. I mean, we've got COVID, you know, that will stop people traveling. And then once COVID sort of goes away, then we're into a recession really, and it's just how deep that is. And I don't think Brexit will help that. Any comments uh, from you, Eva, on the Hoxtons in the UK? No, I think I agree with everything that's been said. I think the, the main issue would have been staffing, but now due to lower um, staffing requirements, it's probably not so much of an issue. I think the overarching question is probably more when will people travel again and to what extent, right? I think that will impact the whole overall equation a, a lot more in the current environment now. Well, Ashley's travelling already, aren't you? I am. I've been traveling for the last five weeks. I've been in Germany, France, Belgium, Austria, been meeting our teams in those regions uh, for the last five years, our investors, our projects. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I think I'm somewhat lucky to be living in Amsterdam and uh, Europe has had a bit more pragmatic uh, approach to the whole lockdown mm. and reopening. So but yes, we are looking, worried. You're probably worried looking forward it. to Brexit uh, in yeah. order to uh, get things settled down. Uh, Oh, contrary. Of course, we're not. Uh, we, we're very much worried. Of course, quite quite a big part of my portfolio, our portfolio, is in the UK. Uh, skill sets, lack of employ, you know, uh, lack lack of uh, resources, cost. All these are very very big uh, challenges that we're going to face. Our people and uh, culture team has been working on this uh, solution for Brexit for the last three years. Uh, they always now had to take in consideration the COVID impact, but uh, we're reaching out. Uh, for training and hiring and rehiring purposes post Brexit, um, some some uh, untapped mark, you know, employment sources that maybe industry has not looked into before. So you know, we're trying to be as careful and as ready as possible, but nobody knows fully if it's a hard or soft Brexit and what the implications will be. Well, it'll be an interesting Brexit. That that much I'm willing to force mm. forecast. Yeah. So I'm afraid we've run out of our time. So I have one final question for our wonderful panelists, um, which is a short answer, please. Um, so even if a vaccine is successfully found, what do you think are the most likely structural changes to our industry in the short and in the longer term arising from COVID-19? Or what do you think the next hot things are going to be that will positively affect our sector in the short and longer term? So either way, it's a one word answer to each one, uh, the short and the longer term. Uh, ben, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, I think consumer sentiment to both uh, and how confident they are in, in, in both situations. OK, Neil? I think it's timing. I think it's a subset of consumer sentiment. It's just a question of when, not if. I think there's an element of, you know, being overblown that the um, meeting spaces will need to be completely repurposed. That business will come back. It's timing. And it's maybe not consumers, it's corporates, but it will come back. And it's just how and when. Okay, Wayne? 
Yeah, I think there's a desire to travel, and I do think that will return when people feel safe. Ashley? Yes, uh, I think the customers' uh, sentiment and comfort to, to travel or feel secure again. And technology, I think COVID pushed the technology now to, to become a bit more uh, actively uh, finding the alternative solutions to everything we do in our hotels. Okay, and finally, not last but not least, Eva. Um, yeah, I think how quickly will consumer confidence return at the end of the day? All right. Ladies and gentlemen uh, of the panel, thank you so much. Um, those of you who have been so kind to tune into this section, session and be with us, we're most grateful. Thank you for all your questions. I'm now going to take a copy of them uh, in order that I can make sure that uh, we try to answer them in, uh, in writing, if not in, uh, in live session like this. Uh, but for the most part, thank you all. Uh, for tuning in and thank you to the panel uh, and I give you uh, a resounding round of applause and hand back to Chris to close the day. Thanks Russell. Thank you Russell and that was a great panel so thank you to all the panelists as well. Uh, that was absolutely excellent. Um, I think um, Karen and James are going to join me at this point as well. Hi Karen, hi James. Welcome and hi Russell. It was great to have you okay. all with us. Um, that's some great, some great uh, comments there, Russell, I thought, in that panel. It's very interesting indeed. Um, I, overall, if I just kick off, the kind of impression I get, which is not an unusual one, I think, as we get to the time, we're all going to have to deal with a life of con just constant uncertainty as we go through the next year and constantly have to adapt. Clearly, we started the day with Graham's uh, fascinating piece about the 13-week cash flow and obviously about how we need to focus on liquidity. And obviously that bit about next year, clearly early next year, is going to be quite challenging for a number of hotel groups, which was really interesting. Uh, Karen and James, I really enjoyed your piece as well, because obviously there's going to be a whole range of contract negotiations you must be doing, which are going to be quite challenging for a whole range of people, and let alone the cheap in it, furlough and everything else is going to be tied and, in. Chris, I was going to, and we are signing some new management contracts, I have to say. We signed one a couple of weeks ago surprisingly, and we're hoping to sign a few more over the next few weeks. So it's, it's not as though all the negotiations are on hold and no one is signing contracts. That's not the case at all. And, and Aaron, was that for a brand new hotel as a project or was that to take over management? Yes, it of an was. It's one that's been under, constru under refurbishment for a, uh, a little while now and is due to open next year in right. London. Because one of the things we're saying is that brand, brand new, uh, development projects where um, maybe not even the financing is secured. That's going to be a challenge in the very short term. I think that's what's interesting. There's all kinds of different messages coming out, aren't there, of some who are finding growth and getting some good figures. I think that came out of the panel as well. And others are going to find it more of a struggle. So the whole thing is going to be a bit of a melting pot as we come through this period. And we're expecting to see a, a Oh dear. Oh dear, Karen, I think you're frozen. Our so. first technical hitch. <laughs> it happens. Um, um, I, I, I know that what the problems in your age look like. Can, can you Wait, just James, repeat that, Karen? Something. Maybe not. James, Sorry, you're James, you were going to come in. Yeah, yeah well, Russell, I think just going back to your, your question around new, new assets, I, I think we're, we're seeing one or two potential new construction finance deals coming to market, but I think the reality is it's going to be back to, you know, the market's always been, it will be, a, it will be a flight to quality. So for the very best assets in the core locations with top brands behind them, those deals probably will go through, but I think it will be much, much harder for, for anything that's not a, in a prime location where there's, there's obvious demand. So I think, you know, it will be kept. And I've, I've said before, I think it will be harder to get finance over the next 12 to 18 months. It was quite interesting yeah. to see this week the deal that Shiver Hotels have announced in central London where uh, they've gone to what I would call a non-bank uh, in order to provide uh, construction finance, but at least they have, and at least it's uh, able to go ahead as a result. I mean, it was two, two non-banks, wasn't it? So, uh... It's interesting to hear the Brexit word come back into discussions as well. <laughs> I've always missed it. <laughs> we can't um, get away from it. Uh, we're literally about out of time. We've got two final questions to pose, uh, if we can. 
Um, Alex, can I ask you to just bring up one? Um, in light of our discussions this morning, when do you now consider it would be prudent for hotel sets in your location to open once government has pressed the green light? So again, already open, less than two weeks, two to three weeks, four to five weeks, one to two months, three months or more. So very similar to as we, as we started, so thank you. Um, and Alex, second question, final question. Um, having listened to the sessions this morning, how, when do you now think that hotel occupancy levels in your location will be back to 2019 levels? 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024, or 2025 or later? That's interesting. So 2022, 42%. That's a bit more encouraging. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, thank you to everybody who's attended today. We really do are grateful for you joining us. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, thank you to Russell, Graham, Karen and James as well for co-partnering with us in this event. And uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. We'll be releasing this recording tomorrow. Um, so anyone who wants a recording, please let us know. And uh, look forward to seeing you. Have a good day and look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very Wonderful. much. And thanks to you and your team, Chris, as well. It's been a pleasure to work with you all. Have a great day and uh, everyone. enjoy Brexit when it comes, it would appear. <laughs>